This is PodKit, episode 16, 1.33 Factor Authentication, on Monday, January 4th, 2016. And now, Brandon's Tinfoil Hat Corner. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk16. Hello, this is Ryan. Welcome to PodKit 16. I wanted to let you know that this was originally the fringe for episode 16, but it was so good, we decided to take this as it is and forego recording episode 16 this week. So this is episode 16, but not the one we originally planned. So I hope you enjoy and have a good one. Hello. It's pretty good. Awesome. Awesome. I can see. I have a lot of devices. They are all ringing. Hello. Nice. Nice. Disarmed. (laughs) Nice. I'm just looking for one last link for the show notes. Excellent. I don't know. Oh, where was it? Oh, are we doing that again? Man, you know, I'm just never going to have. I'm never follow anyone. Is it followers or followees? Change it every single time. Follow, it's got to be followees, because if it were followers, then it would be people who followed us. But we're looking for people who we follow. But I think, right? like, Tweetbot uses the word follows. Or no, followers and following. <laughs> but saying new Twitter following sounds very, like, culty. I, I, yeah. I wallow and follows as the follows wallow in... Okay, well, I added to the dictionary, what? so it's, it's a good start, right? Hey, so we're going to talk about... I'm, I'm so excited for this fringe because I'm going to talk about two-factor auth at the U because this is awesome because I do all sorts of stuff with that. In fact, that was basically my entire week last week and the week before and the week before that. Wow, because I was I was just... I was doing some two two factor stuff last I don't know, like a month ago, and I was just poking around a little bit. Yes, a uh, couple of days ago because I was enabling it for Amazon. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, ooh, I wonder if the UFM would do this, and I'm like, oh, Brandon's the perfect person to talk to about that. <laughs> Very much. You bet. I like my team is like we 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 do the that thing, enterprise two factor authentication. In fact, I can show you our website unless I'm embarrassed by it. <laughs> that is a very little os i agree oh wait, you're looking you guys are looking at intermezzo yeah it's, it's so cool. like those two kids they're fun 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 have you guys I, I think i've i think both of them have been on my follow list recently not uh, they've just like that's just because they're just awesome in their own right and don't like they they don't need me saying that they're awesome to clarify their awesomeness because they are pretty darn awesome. Like Ashley AG Dubs on Twitter, she is like I think she's like in charge of the Node.js like she's in charge of like some really awesome Node.js committee, which is fun because they're are not a lot of awesome committees or something. Can never have enough committees. Never, never. The committees are never sufficient. Can I suggest my own titles, even if I just said the title that I just suggested? Because I just did that. That Oops. is totally fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not paying attention. I just inserted an emoji into the docs, and it took me a minute. I'm now all alert. No worries. Okay, let's see this. NPM, what is her thing? Oh, Ash- Ashley does the awesome breakfast uh, repo. Have you guys heard of that? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. I it's not. literally, I'll, I'll put it in the, in the fringe notes. It's basically a thing where you can watch a bunch of cool talks, and it's basically like you know just a fifteen-minute talk. That's cool. um, That you can listen to while you're 
you know, eating your breakfast or something hmm. ostensibly similar to that. Interesting. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's right. And this is our, I'll just show this to you guys because our listeners probably won't care so much about um, Duo because du Duo is the, the thing that we use at the U. Um, so will you support the, the push thing in Duo? You betcha. Because I've never used that. Does any main service support that? Like Google or Amazon or Dropbox? Because that's what I use Duo for so far. I don't think Google does, but I know that basically everything at the U that I've used does. So like um, a couple of our internal systems, um, basically anything that uses Duo through the university's authentication provider, which is anything that I would touch at the U basically, it is push enabled. I think there are a couple of other things that are push enabled, but I'm not sure what they are. I think like, cause the, the people, the higher ed folks who mm -hmm. brought duo to higher ed, basically, um, they were like big on push because, you know, Student services folks don't like to have to type in long numbers because that's annoying. I don't, it blame is them. annoying. I don't like to type in long numbers either. Terrible. Don't do that. Only six. Right? And if I have a number pad that just like psh, done. Just flies. Yeah. But some some people some people really hate that. So. Yeah. It's it's the whole extra step. Yeah, I agree. And the nice thing about us with our watches, Brandon, is we just hit it on the watch and then we're done. So we don't even have to take our phone out of our pocket. It's right, there. right. And I could use the duo app on my watch, but I almost find that it's faster to just use my phone. Cause like you know, to get the watch text instead. What? Like to get the text instead. Yeah. And just, just get the, like, read the, the number from the text on your phone. Yeah. I've, I've tried it both ways. See, I usually try to just load the app, but if I can't load the app or, you know, somehow that's not working, I'll, yeah, without fail, I'll just send a text to my watch. And then all of a sudden, Hey, look, it's there, which is fun. Yeah. Um, so but what, the thing, or, mm -hmm. sorry, continue. No worries. Oh, just the thing that I was going to say was that I actually had to use two-factor in order to get into my Google account here because um, I, I haven't logged into Google on this computer in a long time because uh, I, don't, I don't really use this Google account very much. It's like my main Google account. That's not my U Google account, but now that I'm at the U, it's like everything has to go through that. Otherwise, it's stuck in that fun little cross-domain Google limbo, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That, that's exactly that. why I don't use my personal Ryan at RyanRampersad.com Google Apps. It's just too much work. Yeah, I can't do it. I mean, I should I, do it. I'm, I'm going to avoid it. multiple accounts if I can. Yeah. It's going to be sad to say bye to my U of M account. Though. I mean, I'm going to try and keep it active as long as I can for EDU discounts, but uh, eventually there will come a day where I no longer use it. Yeah, well... That's fair, but uh, how, do you, how do you log like, into the uh, U email without having your X five hundred? Uh so your account will exist in perpetuity, essentially. Your guys as well. Okay. Um, it's just a matter of whether it's accessible to you or not. Great. Right. Okay. So, so <laughs> it it will always exist. It's just a matter of whether the, oh, I wish I could show you a diagram, but I don't have access to the diagram and it's not with me. But essentially there's like the part of your identity that the U keeps track of, mm -hmm. right? That's your, that's your X500 or your internet ID. Yeah. We know that we will, we will keep that internet ID and it'll be yours like long after we're all decomposed into fossil fuels, right? It's um, a long time. Right, right. Or presumably, assuming assuming that we're still keeping track of identities, then right. Um, but the uh, the thing that might change, right, is whether Google is still keeping track of your email, right. So your inbox and stuff is all living in the Google sphere, as you might imagine, mm -hmm. yeah. just like any other Google Apps domain. Okay. The trick is, once you get a degree from the U of M. You so long as you keep logging in once every ninety days, and that's like legit login, like mail that you amend at edu. Yeah, login and mm -hmm. not like uh, an email client thing because an email client one actually doesn't hit our system; it goes straight right. to Google. So mm -hmm. we don't we don't actually care re register those. Yeah, um, then your account will stay open. But if if 
after like if you don't log in within 180 days right within basically half a year oh it's 180 i thought it was 90 it is so that's that's the trick right so it's 90 days and then it gets it's like okay one last chance and then you have another 90 days and if that if if it's not hit within that second 90 days then you're then your account's locked and you've got a you've got a you've got to go to college uh, again you got to go to college again right no basically what happens is after the first 90 days your password is locked right so nobody can log in you have to call my office and uh we'll get you a new we'll you know we'll identify you verify your identity authenticate you and then we'll get you a new password Hmm. and then um the trick is like if it's past that 180 day threshold like google has deleted your email Mm -hmm. if it's within those 90 90 to 180 days it's still likely that even though your account's locked your email will likely still be there at least that's my understanding I should probably okay. not speak with such authority because it's been a little while since I've been in that role. But <laughs> it's more authority than we had. It's okay. So yeah, Brenda, what is your job title again, or where have you, or do you work? I we went over this earlier in the summer, but I <laughs> forgot. But it's changed since then, so it's okay. so it's a little bit easy. It's yeah, it's probably good to revisit. So um, I worked uh, originally at, at the help desk as a regular old technology help specialist. So I would answer phones answer questions just like these, which is why these answers probably sound so practiced because we're probably given them like 50 million times. Hopefully they're, <laughs> hopefully they're finally good, right? Um, but uh, then after that, I started working with uh, the software developers, the you, the web app developers. Mm-hmm. And uh, there I'm uh, just, just a rando who writes JavaScript and Node and stuff. My job title is actually, believe it or not, still the same. Like if, if you look at it, I think my job class is something like um student let me check log in no maybe i can't log in um because i forgot i don't have my like none of my passwords are on this computer so i'll have to enter them manually like a barbarian but um (laughs) um but i think my job class is something like uh student technical support representative or something um so that's that is officially my job title but I do a lot of things that are not really typical of a student technology support representative, like designing and building web applications. And when I say design, I mean like like from a systems architecture standpoint, like writing all the tech- technical documentation, yada, yada, and uh, getting it approved by folks, which is fun, and um, getting it reviewed by more folks and getting it criticized by a couple more folks. And then- So you're like a super, super worker. Board. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a, I'm like a, weird combo of a student developer who basically is like a mini regular developer who they can pay less which is fine i like my job quite a bit and my pay is probably fair to the to the work that i'm doing but it's really nice because they get they get cheap labor and i get to learn how to do things that's pretty good i enjoy it it's it's a little more applicable to your field than me being lighting supervisor but maybe less fun you never know (laughs) I don't know about um, that. I like doing light stuff, but I also feel like I miss out on a lot of uh, experience. I feel like you guys just rock it with the web things, and I'm like, hey, guys. I just I figured out my dependency issue, so now my website works in development again. Nice. Yeah, it's, no, it's I don't strap know. Strap and Font Awesome were too new. It <laughs> broke with whatever I – I don't know what I was doing with it. Gotcha. I need to use – I need to read – I think I'm gonna still do Angular because that's easy to port code over. Yeah, but just yeah. Start with the version three instead of version two generator. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So the the one thing that I've noticed, right? And I think Max, our friend of the show, Max Fierke, um, yep. tweeted a while back about this. But when you, when you do this for like a day job, it's it all of a sudden becomes a lot harder to do it for fun. <laughs> right? Yeah, I I noticed that this summer when I was. I mean, I didn't do that much stacking. I was like files on a web server when yeah. that's what i developed with this summer yeah for my job. and so at home it was a little different because i used a full stack and yeah had access to package managers where i couldn't at school or at, at work because of proxy things but yeah burnt out i know i know what you mean yeah but it's, it's still so much fun and like i still find new things to do like my biggest my newest addiction so far is like docker and redis which is like i am such a typical like all i'm missing is react and then i and then i'd be like the token web developer millennial right <laughs> yeah stay away from that don't do that 
right right but um oh docker is so awesome like i can just spin stuff up like oh i i was so i was so close to being able to compile um war machine and go for my linux computer in docker because may as well right yeah um, but but i didn't because i'm lame and well now i'm trying to figure out how to shot. rewrite the go version to not suck anymore so that's fun uh does it suck what happened well so it turns out uh there were some bugs and uh so by fixing one small and minor bug i've almost doubled the performance on the macbook air nice double um, nice yeah what was, what was the bug so there's two bugs that are sort of one bug um <laughs> and so the so basically when you give cards to the winning deck it would shuffle before before it called that give cards method and then it would yeah. shuffle again inside of the get cards method oh yeah so so it's two shuffles that the an extra shuffle that wasn't necessary but then but as was a, it really did it really help the shuffleness or was it extra shuffling because it never hurts to shuffle more yeah i think it was probably <laughs> overkill but then so if that wasn't bad enough so for some stupid reason I had give cards, which gives all of the cards from one deck to the other deck. So if a person, if the winning deck, you know, if you had a war, all of those cards from the war pile, that should just right. be given to the winner, all of them. Well, yeah. for some reason, I had that give cards, give cards with an S. I had that method wrapped in a loop that would go from zero to the N, where N is the length of the winning deck. So yeah, yeah. it would call give cards n times okay and that means it would shuffle n times an empty deck after the first time yeah okay so you, yeah cool yeah so better i fixed some bugs and so nice. now what i'm working on is an improvement further than that so i discovered in like i'm sure it's fine in rust but why not do it anyway so in yeah. rust uh threads or random the random generator is thread safe so it, it can be when you get one it's not shared among all the threads so synchronization isn't an issue in yeah. go the random generator is not synchronized or i mean it is synchronized and so whenever you ask for a random number all the threads have to line up and wait so i fixed that in go but i noticed in in rust even though it is a threaded safe library, I decided to pull it out and pass a unique generator towards each, uh, you know, tight loop of running the game. Yeah. And so we'll see how that goes. I haven't gotten it to work yet. It's a big upgrade. Fancy new features. Yeah. Nice. And yeah, just send it in Slack and we'll be your beta testers. Yeah. Well, I'll generate new, new builds eventually once I figure out how this thing works. I think the the biggest performance thing on my computer was turning off what pulse. Yeah. Have I mentioned this at some point? I've heard I've heard no. I know you it use tracks, it. It tracks clicks and keyboard types. I've used used it since fall of 2009. Yeah. But it's this I think it's uh the UI is written in in QT, I think. Oh, but, right, right, right. So it's yeah. But it it runs it like maxes out a CPU or a single thread. At least on my, uh, I don't know. At least on my MacBook earlier this fall when I was looking at it, or maybe now it like maxes out a thread every like five seconds for eternity to do some database. It's probably re it's really inefficient, but I still run it because this I've done it for so long. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Turning that off and then running War Game so really helped. A lot. You got like a 44, which is amazing because even my computer here on Windows was only getting like a 24. Hmm. Well, that was on my MacBook too. Yeah, that's why I think it's amazing. Like that, might be a little bit. that is awesome. So, huh. I, I I don't know. I mean, we'll have to have the Rust version also updated to see if Rust is better or worse. We'll find out. And Java, don't forget about Java. Yeah, we can forget about Java. We're done with that. Java is a Python version and a Swift version. You should make a Bash version. There's no yeah. reason. <laughs> so, so Rust is a compi uh, not not Rust. Swift is compiled, right? It's not. Yep. Okay. That could I could do that, but but why would I want to? 
because Swift is awesome. Oh but my gosh, but it's not cross platform, man. It is. It's it is. well, it's not, it's not quite cross platform enough for you, maybe, but it's cross platform ish. It's vaguely cross platform, right? Uh, <laughs> Did it distribute binary version of it for any platform, or not really, except for OS ten? OS ten and Linux. I don't think they have one for Windows yet. Nope. Yeah. What's Windows? Has anyone gotten it to work on Windows yet? I'm sure. I don't think so. I'm on the. I'm watching the Swift Dev and Swift Users mailing list, and so far, like they've got it for free BSD, but that's about it. Yeah, but no, no one wants it on Windows. Well, I'm sure <laughs> they do. because then but, people might start developing for Apple on Windows. What about developers? 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 What was <laughs> developers, that? Developers, 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 developers. I think you got it. <laughs> developers, 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 developers. Mm, that sounds about right. <laughs> you're you're saying that like the Buffalo, 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 Buffalo. I don't remember how exactly. many of this. Exactly. There we go. I was thinking of some combo of developers there, <laughs> but Buffalo developers works. So back to two factor. Is there a way to do two factor for your main web login on U of M? There is not, but it would be really cool if we could. So is it, is it just kind of used internally for certain apps, or yeah? So at, at the I've never U, seen the option. I don't think. So at the U, there's there's this um, there's this model of determining what sort of data is supposed to be private and highly restricted. And what sorts of data is supposed to be um, at, on kind of a different continuum, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or on, it's all on the same continuum, but on, on different levels of the continuum. And there are people who are spending a lot, a lot, a lot of time and energy and brain power into figuring out what sorts of applications and what sorts of data fall under which categories, right? Or fall, fall into different places on the continuum. And in, in a certain range of the continuum, one of the things that's required, right? So like stuff with people's social security numbers in it, or even like names and addresses or other sorts yeah. of private info or research data, for example, that stuff is like required by law, by policy, by some person asking for it yeah. uh, to be classified in a certain sense so that it needs to be put behind two-factor authentication. And that's really, I think, what what causes most of the things at the U that are put behind two-factor off to be put behind two-factor off. Other things include people like us building applications, it, assuming we were all under the employment of the U, right? And when we build applications, the developer has a choice to put it to put the app behind two-factor. And that's like just a little configuration change, in fact. I can show some of it right here. I think there's a really awesome doc about it uh, online. I'll see if I can pull it up. Um, in fact, there is, and it's on the Duo website. Look at that. Uh, no, it's not. Oops, that's different. Never mind. Uh, basically, it's it's really quick. You just add one little line to your uh, shibboleth config file thingamajigger. Yeah. Uh, can you guys tell I've done this a lot? No, I, I've done it like just <laughs> twice or three times. Uh, but there, there, there's a way you can do it. It's just like a quick little one-liner. And all of a sudden, yay, it's behind Duo. That's awesome. And you just have to tell us about it. And that's 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 all it is to it from the application perspective. There's okay. not really a way yet for users to to set that up themselves, but I'm working on it. Because then, cause then you, you'd it. have to attach to each username a field if you want to use two-factor, and then it would have to be kind of pushed across the global uh, login. Yeah, I mean, or whatever I, it's called. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple. There are a couple different things, and one 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 of the one of the things is that, like in the past, right? Because because the because Duo use has been so driven by like by this model of like people, like the 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 grand imperator of student data, for example, right? Or the grand imperator of staff data, or the grand imperator of like uh, all checkbooks. You know, the, that the, sounds like a great title. Bit. Hmm? Great title, right? Right. the the people The people who maintain the data, right? Th those are really the people who like drove uh, the way in which two factor, like who decides who gets access to two factor, right? And that's that's all like out there in the world. I think I don't think I'm saying anything groundbreaking when I say that, 
but as a result like two factor is not on by default for most people or it's not really it's not like a choice for most people but there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of momentum towards making that a possibility in the near future i don't know if it'll be done by the time you graduate <laughs> but um well should, i hope to hold be... on to my account so yeah yeah is there any... I... or... mm -hmm. anyway i can I'm... script continuous login <laughs> yeah like right, let's right. encrypt kind of thing you know just cron job it up <laughs> oh that'd be awesome but um i i have to say like I, I hope i'm not sounding too cagey when i say this i just don't know how much of what i'm saying is like legit or not because that like there there are lots of new people who i am reporting to now so i don't know what they think of me or what they think of me saying words that i don't really know a whole lot about but they won't they probably won't mind terribly much if i just say <laughs> we're working on it <laughs> So hopefully, hopefully those answers are helpful and not super cagey sounding, but yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. But it's, it's happening and you better believe that it's, it's not like, but like the people who maintain two factor auth, like they are really digging it. Like we, we all think it's a slick, really cool, important thing that people should have access to. It's not like folks being like, no, we will take all of the two factor auth for ourselves. Ha ha ha. No, it's just, are you sure it's, it's just not just like that? That sounds perfect. Yeah. It's, <laughs> we're, we're the grand imperators of two-factor auth, one might say. JK. But so, yeah, seriously, if, if you want to hack on two-factor auth at the U, a great place to go is Campus Code Fest. Um, because Can I go after I graduate? Yeah, you betcha, I think. Is it open for anyone? Although, as an alum, that would probably get me a lot farther than a rando. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I, psh, Heck, I'd I'd bring you. Yeah. How come is your plus up. one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm like there 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 are folks who um there are folks all from all over the U who do it in all sorts of weird tenuous relationships to the U theoretically. So, hmm. or I guess I don't know. I haven't met all of them, but people I haven't seen before are there. So I'm gonna consider them randos. <laughs> so yeah. So what services do you guys use two factor auth for, if any? You want to go first, Ryan? I've been saying lots of words. <laughs> um, Google, basically. That's all I do. All of your Google accounts? No. So <laughs> I have a lot of Google accounts, but uh, my primary Daybreak Master account is two-factored. And that's a very nice thing because I don't care. Um, in fact, I don't care so much. My Google account password that I use daily and that is my very important lifeline to everything the password for that account is stored in plain text under the files directory on my server at home. Oh, no. Because I just don't care. YOLO. <laughs> um, however, I must say how convenient that is because whenever I need to log in on pretty much anything, I don't have to log into LastPass and type my password that's absurdly long, like six times, uh, to copy and paste you know, my 25-character Google password. Yeah. So there's that. Um, I have I have uh, the two-factor Google, what is it called, the Authenticator app. It has material design now, which you won't be able mm -hmm. to see because everything's blue here, apparently. Uh, okay. So it's pretty cool. That's kind of weird. Um, I, I, I have looked at the... I, ha I did try the Facebook two-factor. Didn't like it because it was annoying. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think I use... Maybe, maybe my apple thing is two-factored but i don't think it is because i yeah i don't know um i found your password <laughs> yeah isn't that easy <laughs> oh i should have remembered your number on your phone when you showed it to us i could have logged in yeah you could have <laughs> <laughs> oh no oh well i missed my shot yeah the, the, that that number's already expired oh no so i think i think two factor is really cool i would use it more if i had more services that i didn't necessarily need to rely on i guess because that means i have to have my phone and if i don't have my phone i can't do anything about it 90 percent right. of the time i'm at home and if i don't have my phone i'm already have i already have a safe session so it's okay yeah so i guess i, I, feel I don't always worry about it then now there have i have had some close calls though as you know i have a lot of phones <laughs> and i get a new phone at least every year if not faster and one time I might have forgotten to 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 just go to the service in the in the Google control panel for two factor and say switch devices. Uh, I forgot to do that. So I couldn't 
switch the authenticator to a new phone without turning it off and turning it back on. Hmm. So it ruined my five year, three year, some year streak. Oh gosh, yeah. So sad. I just I I turned it on in the, uh, maybe a month and a half ago mm-hmm. for uh, my Apple account, my Google account, my Amazon account recently, like last week, and my Dropbox account. I f- I started with Dropbox because I figured that's where my one password <clears throat> one password uh, database is. So I figured that was pretty important. But then I'm like, okay, my email has a bunch of stuff too for recovery. Yep. Right. 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 I have a bunch of stuff on Apple, so there as well. And then I'm like, but Amazon has my credit card as well as some <laughs> family members, so maybe I'd do that as well. And I looked on Facebook, but I didn't really figure it out, so I just turned away. Yeah, Facebook's I believe it. Password since 2009 for me. <laughs> See, I believe that Facebook uses some weird thing where it's at, like Twitter did this a while ago too, where it's based on the app itself, right? So if you log in from your from your Facebook account, it'll ping your phone, which is already logged into Facebook, mm-hmm. and use that as the two factor. Or I feel like I remember hearing about that at some point. I don't. I don't really like those schemes. They don't make me very happy. Tbh, they're too magical. Yeah, I mean, I don't it's think consistent. it's that. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, if your phone gets a text message and Facebook knows who it's expecting it from, why why not do it automatically? That's, That's true. true. I, the yeah. trick is, I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a text message. I think it's one of their little shady facebook i'm it, pinging you but i don't but you don't know i'm pinging you messages well that's so it's, weird. it's not user facing but all handled within the app exactly exactly well, how is so that two factor then because exactly that's it's that's like, my it's like 1.33 factor exactly because <laughs> like have you guys have you guys heard about this this is where this is brandon's tinfoil hat corner here <laughs> but I, I fully i fully appreciate that this is this is, sounds kind of ludicrous but who was it i want to say it was marco or somebody was talking on ATP a while back about how the Facebook app will play silent audio at random times. Yes, and I heard that. So. That, was, that was a bug, according to Facebook's uh, response. That was about the same time as that episode came out. Uh, but that's Instagram what. That's what. Um, that's what my software PR instructor told me to say whenever I did something yeah. terrible. It's a bug. Wink, wink. <sighs> yeah, but at the same time, I feel like Facebook would hopefully rely uh, count on. Um, users being somewhat happy with their phone in terms of battery life, because I think Facebook really tracks you all the time anyway. They don't need to be running as a front-facing application. I mean, like, are there APIs for location backgrounding? No, totally right. But the tr- the trick the trick right is that there's other stuff that they want that they can't get when they're running in the background, which is why the silent audio thing works. Again, yeah. with my tinfoil hat on, I'm saying this. Right, you know, if it's, if um, I, it's kind of surprising because it's easy, even easier to do that on Android. So then, I guess the question is, why don't they have that directly on Android then, if that's the case? So like, you don't even have to hide with 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 silent audio. You could just have a completely background application on Android, and it's oh, it's totally. fair game. So I guess the question is, why don't they do that then on Android directly, or do they? Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly right and you know again i i'm i should i should preface that by saying that i you know as i tweeted today i'm studying advertising i don't think advertising and targeting are objectively bad things in all situations i just don't like it sometimes when i feel like it's being done under my nose and i think that's a pretty reasonable expectation as an advertiser and as a consumer to not be spied on underneath my own face even if they even if Silently, they say words, no less. The thing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You should enter uh, Brandon's tin foil hat corner into the fringe uh, titles. That's it's already there. I did, it, I did it already. Oh my god! I have a a tweet to show you about ad ad block. This isn't like super related. I'll pop it in fringe notes here though. Um, you know Forbes has that horrible website. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know a lot of it's places have hot. horrible websites. Weren't they hacked today or something? I feel like I remember hearing about them being like... So they were better today than normal. Oh, that's good. (laughs) The tweet bot copy link to tweet is broken. Uh, But hold on. I'm opened in Safari. This one. Hey, nice. I made it a link. 
Oh right, 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 right. I this I remember seeing this. Oh no. Right, Leslie Carhart. Oh, she's awesome. Like her and uh, Logan Atwood, top ten Twitter folks. Well, is, Le- is Leslie a person who will retweet it for you? Okay, yeah, so yep. it's, it is from Forbes. Man, that's so bad. Jonathan uh, Zizarki. The, I put he was in a Twitter follow thing a couple months ago. Right, that's where I saw it. Right. I think I think they all they all run together in information security web Twitter. Web I I follow a lot of information security web Twitter, and it's right. It's fun. You know, it's I, a good I, Twitter to follow. Do you do either of you follow one bad idea or bad idea? Yeah, I yeah, used zero. to and I stopped a while ago. Yeah, yeah, I also stopped. Uh, it got a little too too hard, too annoying. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but I like that kind of stuff. I do enjoy. Yeah. That. I I you know. I might like someone's tweets a lot, but if it's too just too much, I can't take it. There's there is a limit of too many tweets from one person. <laughs> well, yeah, and, I mean, and I guess you know, for normal things, I would say if they're about if a person is really a niche topic person, yeah, I guess yeah. I expect more topical content. Yeah, I'd agree. Or you can be all over the place and just be an ordinary person. I guess. Yeah. That's that's kind of why I've I have two Twitter accounts, I feel, because I have a lot of friends back when I had one account who would always tell me, stop talking about tech so much under Twitter. That's so weird. Isn't that what Twitter's for? Right. I don't know. That was in I switched I split them in two thousand twelve, I think in March. So I'm approaching on three years four wait. Four years now, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So it's been nice. I kind of want to merge them together sometimes, but at the same time, I feel like it's a good separation even for me to view content. Because, like, do I feel like tech or do I feel like everything else? That's true. That's true. And then, like, you guys are in the middle, and it's then I have to. And then it's when you guys have a big conversation, and I see it in one account, I read it, and the other one's like, scroll, scroll, scroll. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. They're like, yeah, yeah, I'm over this. I've I've been here before. <laughs> but occasionally I scroll and I like I'm scrolling too fast and I miss a tweet from one of you or you know, someone who I follow. I think I follow you guys and Max Fergie on both accounts. Mm-hmm. Cause like I have con- I don't know, yeah. It fits both the criteria. And so sometimes I'll see something on the second time I see it, I'm like, oh, I didn't even read that really the first time. That's interesting. And then I have to go find the other account to favorite it or something. Right, right. Or I see it, I want to favorite it, but then I forget to favorite it on the other account when I see it. That's happened too. No, I getcha. I getcha. See, I it's really funny for me because I started I started on Twitter. When I started on Twitter, like nobody else I knew was on Twitter. Like yep. literally, I, I joined Twitter so I could follow David Pogue. Because yep. David Pogue is pretty cool. Middle eighty five of cool. Yeah, right. And <laughs> now he now he's with Yahoo, which is fine. Yahoo the decision for him to make. He's pretty cool with the New York Times too. But um his you know He was cooler at the New York funny. Times, to be honest. What was that? He was cooler at the New York Times. Yeah, I would agree. Because but it's the New York Times. Me. He still follows yeah, me on Twitter. That's the best. He's, he does? He's, How many he's a prize does he follow? Uh, let's see. Or do you not want to look at look at that? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at it right now. So he follows seventeen, uh, one thousand seven hundred ninety one people, and I am one of those. All right, that's not too bad. That's about he as has, many as you follow, right? He has one point five seven million followers too. It's ludicrous. Is he verified? But he's verified. Yeah, I am. I am at sixteen fifty. So he follows just slightly more people than I do. I think the last time. Or no, like at the beginning of the summer, when I first found out you followed a lot of people, it was like 1,200. You know, yeah. they should have they should have another, like, you know, verified for famous people, but just verified for normal people. <laughs> yeah. I think my uncle, who's a reporter for Chicago Public Radio, is verified on Twitter. Nice. He's got, I don't know, 4,000 followers. So I feel like, I feel like really as of last year or two, Twitter has really pushed for verification. They need to push like harder. 
Let yeah, me but send, like more, let me, more people let me, out let me send them a dollar with my photo ID and they can verify me. Yeah. And look, they it's, just it, earned a hundred million dollars. Done. Yeah. It's it's become you know, currently it's a thing of this is a famous person ish and this is who they claim they are. You know, it's like it's valid. But yeah, yeah, I think bringing it to the mass would be kind of cool too. Yeah. It seems like there are a lot of ways that you could verify that one is who they say they are, right? Like one thing would be like domain name ownership, which is a whole other can of worms that domain name ownership is really tricky, but you have to give uh, an address, right? And you have to give some sort of registration for, you know, for it, for that to work. Yeah, yeah. you could, but domain names, how do you, how do you get around uh, like uh, private who is? Right, right. So I should, I should, I should have prefaced that by saying that I didn't think that a domain name would be a way to authenticate somebody, but I meant that that's kind of in some ways a model for how you could do it. Not that I think okay, it's super good, cool for another place to have our address. I feel like but you're right. I feel like that used to be I a thing. That. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody liked it because it didn't work. Yeah. No, totally. Totally. There's, a, you know, there's other ways too. Like um, when you have like that thing you have to do when you fax your pa- or you send your passport in or whatever yeah, to be. I, I, I'm fine with that. That's good enough for me. Passportified or whatever. Yeah, or heck, even like scan your driver's license or that's, whatever. That's, that's what I thing. would suggest, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't also, even know if you have to scan it. You just take a picture of it. Right. And then you, send, wonder... you send it to them in a direct message. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wonder if we'll ever get to a point where the government issues digital, uh, like digital keys for identification and things like that. Oh, I, I hope it's very soon. I hope so. I don't know. Right? Because... Like um, the the Estonian government did that a while back, right? That that was a yeah. thing where you can become an Estonian like citizen. That. Well, the, Esto- we, the Estonia we... government also has e voting that works, so you know that's pretty cool too. Have we have we talked about this before? I feel like we might have talked about this before. I don't know. A little. I read it on your website, so that that might be what we're thinking of. But, yeah, it's possible because yeah, I do remember that that was on e voting, the e voting page, or we it, as part of the e voting discussion, certainly. Yeah. I you know Estonia has has all that, but there's only like, I, okay, I don't know the population, but it's really tiny compared to the U.S. population, yeah. and geography wise, it's much smaller. And I think even more importantly, by the the demographics of the country is much more homogenous than what we have here, in terms yeah. of race, but also age, uh, income level, skill set, blah 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 blah. Oh, and True. they have fiber. <laughs> yeah the u.s is really hard to compare to any other country because it's mass size and uh diversity i think and the, the our society is just so weird <laughs> like just so do you so guys st- watch tom scott on youtube i do no should I? Did, did you see his new video about uh british and advertising uh i, I, I don't, I don't watch it too frequently but i, I watch him free sometimes Okay. I wish to watch this. Thing. It's it's, it's about computer. hey, it's Tom Scott. I know that guy. Yeah, he's the guy from Computer File. Sometimes I think, right? Right, right. I've, right. He's friends with Brady. Brady, Brady Heron of Internet uh, Hello Internet fame and stuff. Yeah, they I do. really enjoyed subscribing to him on YouTube. I found I think I follow him on Twitter, and I watch his show Park Bench. It's like YouTube podcast, pretty much. Right, right, right. So this YouTube. is the the one that you're referring to is the one that's why Britain sucks at product placement, right? Yeah. Hey, if look, advertising. <laughs> we we all joke. A couple of my friends who are also in the Stratcom program, including including but not limited to myself, um, are. Uh, we always joke that the internet gives us a better Stratcom education sometimes than our than our courses do. <laughs> Sorry, you know, Stratcom. We could say the same thing about the computer science courses. That's, That's true. true. But computer science courses um, introduce. Um, like a solid schedule for learning and I don't accountability. I, I don't know. Maybe, but, they, but, they, but, yeah. but, but schooling does that. They introduce accountability and scheduling. But you could have learned everything you know yourself. Yeah, could have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think for me, which is not yet written, although it will be written in my reviews of the UMN computer science program, is right, that right. I was able to take courses as more or less of a required quarter of the curriculum that 
basically made me love the things that I thought I would hate. So, for example, exactly. I never want. I was always just going to be a nice, you know, calm web programmer programming in my PHP and JavaScript. But then, you know, what came across the desk? Some hardcore Compilers. C and a system, <laughs> yep. and then a compiler, and some hardcore C plus plus, and then Rust. And and now look, I've used any of that. Now I'm a bloody <laughs> freak, and uh, I I go look up source code for operating systems and compilers and. Who knows what? No, it's awesome. I think you're exactly right. That's one of the things that I like about. Um, that's one of the things that's fun about university in general is that like you get to slash are semi encouraged slash forced to try out new disciplines in in situations that you might have not otherwise encountered them. Like even even a web programming class that I took, right? And like I've I've been doing this. I've been in this game for some time. Um, but I, I always learn new stuff, even when I'm doing things that I haven't, uh, doing things that I've ostensibly been working on for ages or, you know, yeah. things that I ostensibly know a lot about. It's just a, a good way to, sh to show yourself that there's a lot more to learn and a good way to find that you actually enjoy things that you might not have otherwise enjoyed, like calculus, for example. Well, uh, you know, like, okay, maybe, but that's a little bit different. That's true. That's true. Cal I think I think your compiler's example is better than my calculus one. Well, so sure. like, <laughs> I, I remember telling my calculus teacher in high school, yep, uh, where Brian and I also went to. I remember telling them, you know, this class has been a lot more interesting than the last three years of, you know, whatever math they called it. Like, what was the math at Central called, Brian? I don't remember. What do you mean? What 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 kind of math? Uh, you know, like they like, like IB, what was before IB calculus, like uh, AP, uh, pre pre IB pre IP. Yeah, but what IB? was the class yeah. called? It was called something else because they couldn't just call it that. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. It's been a long time, but but yeah, basically, called pre calc, but yeah. But basically, you know, before calculus, you you just have your basic arithmetic. I took geometry and then algebra two, and then I did pre calc and calc. Oh. That's what I did. I, I don't know. I th I feel like calculus is different than f like the first three years of your education for math at, in high school because you you get so much boredom in just using the same five geometric axioms and the same clever tricks with uh, uh with, with your arithmetic and your um I don't know that kind of thing. Yeah, but then yeah. but then you get your calculus and it's like oh crap now I can just do pretty much anything. Yep. And then the next step after that is to uh, add some stats in or to add some uh, some of those, um, I don't know, uh, infinite sequences to model things you oh, can't no. derive. You know, there, there's yep. so, the, it, it really does expand from there. But I think one of the problems with classes, especially at the U, but probably just everywhere, is that, you know, we're so focused on what we need to cover in the course and we're so focused on getting the grade that we need to pass that we don't have any extra time to just explore and convince ourselves that this stuff is worth it in some way sometime maybe yeah 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 i've definitely had a couple of classes at the u that have been really good at at making time for that and i've had a couple others that were not in fact, that's one of the things I like to talk about when we get to the show with uh, this uh, Rust-based kernel that uh, a couple of JavaScript mm. and Rusty folks are working on. Mm, because, Rust. Um, right? Because as, as you'll see there, and as we'll talk about later, they actually reference a textbook that I used this semester in 2021 as like one of the inspirations for it. Because they're like, this is such a good textbook. And I'm like, how would I know? Uh, what was your textbook would, called? Uh, I think you listed si Like Computer Systems, uh, A Programmer's Perspective third edition i think it's bryant and o'halloran uh, i'm sure you listed it right one. here didn't you list it uh yeah yep. yeah there it that is one. if you if you just search cs colon app 3e it yeah. should show up immediately yep it's one of you know one of those textbook authors that's really heavily acronym based well so i wanted to find out if it was the same <laughs> book i used i think th i think it's a new edition but yeah yeah it's got it's, it's the same one. computer systems by bryant sounds familiar what a cool yep. name! Yeah, it's it. It was a cool textbook. I have to admit, I didn't. I uh, had significant issues uh, obtaining one because the third edition is apparently very hard to find for reasons. 
uh, but I didn't want to buy it because it didn't it didn't seem like the kind of book that I'd want to own. But I'm kind of sad that I didn't buy it. But I'm kind of not because there's lots of other stuff online about it that's more directly applicable. But it was good to have it for the class because you know basically the entire class was about learning these kind of um, simplified assembly and uh, hardware control languages that don't really like they don't see actual use it's just stuff that was built for the book but now i can look at stuff like the intermez os book right and i can look at that and i can say hey look i know what all these instructions mean because i've seen x86 assembly before i've also seen a really dumb simplified version of x86 assembly and i i wrote that so i can i feel comfortable writing this sort of assembly because i wrote that assembly in fact this the assembly that they use in the in the book that i'm going to talk about later is like way 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 easier to write in my in yeah, my estimation it is than, than the assembly that we wrote in the class uh, is, here's the book for reference right. i believe lovely book it's good stuff nice. oh you got it nice yep that's colorful the one. cover they go through the yeah. whole rgb spectrum of course you know textbooks unlike paperback books don't want to reveal their price tag so i don't know how much this cost me when i bought it in, in whatever year that was 2012 I'm just going to put that away before I start reading it. <laughs> I was painting gotcha. through it actually the other week. Nice. So I, I, ta- I said, mentioned colors there and then it reminded me of something I thought of. So every so often I see something that talks about how cool it is in terms of what colors it can show and says, yeah, we can show 16 million colors. Yeah. And I'm just like, yep. I know you're how much uh, memory you put onto each color now. <laughs> yep. Standard, what is that, 8-bit RGB? I think, I think so. I, I like in the book how they have uh, Linux 32, Windows, Linux 64, and Sun. <laughs> guess guess oh, which one's know. the odd one out there? Uh, Windows. Yeah, Linux it, 32. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> nah, I think it's Sun is the odd one out, actually. Spark, spark forever. Spark for life. Spark, not even for a minute. Buddies. No spark. Spark is done. Brendan, I just want to let you know that your link to your your lightning talk is broken. It's four oh fouring. Oh. Uh, oh no. Now I'll tell you, there's nothing more in this book and in that in that twenty twenty one class than one's compliment. I hate one's compliment. <laughs> okay then. It's not just what is me. that. Uh it's but you have to explain it so I like it, not hate it. Okay. Uh <laughs> Like two's compliment, but it sucks. I can't tell you what it is off the top of my head. But it's an annoying thing that is. It's a way to uh, represent a number in a byte or sequence of bytes while maintaining a uh, state bit for plus or plus or minus, so like positive or negative. Yeah. yeah. Right, so Brian, are you familiar with like the other representations for an integer, like two's complement, um, the the bias notation, uh, no. the other one that I'm forgetting. I pretty much um, only know signed and unsigned. Right, right, right. So there are different ways of representing a signed integer, and one of them is to basically, if you look at a number as a series of ones and zeros, to take the first bit and use that to represent the sign. Yeah. That's, so that's the state bit. Yeah. So the the trick is there are a bunch of other ways that you can there are a bunch of other things you can do with the remaining bits that can tell it other things about the the integer. So basically, one's complement is um, if if you have a negative number, then the rest of it will be stored as the number of digits that it takes to. So were you to and that did the the original sequence with um, this other number it would be, everything would be ones. Does that sound about right, Ryan? That sounds right. Still hate it. Yeah, it <laughs> it doesn't, it gives you lots of weird, silly things, and it's never really in use before. I think Duvalis had said that it was basically used by Cray for a while, and then Cray was like, no, this is dumb. And then they did it the right way. You and know, here we are now. When I when I think about it, you know, I, I get I get the 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 uh, the reasoning behind it. Of course, yeah. when you when you don't know enough, so like me, uh, you think well. So then, obviously, the thing to do is to use 
the the leading bit as your sign state bit and all the other yeah. bits are just the number and that's that's the size of the number and yeah. that seems that's of course the you know first level approach and somebody yeah. smarter than me concluded that wasn't a good way to do it and here's a yep. better way to do it but he, what I have to say to that higher level approach is, my gosh, does that suck for our human to do? That's the way we have computers to do it. Exactly. Exactly. It's like a nice wrapper. So you give it a number and it spits out the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that sounds like my whole life. That's pretty much the point. Yep. No, totally. Totally. I get you. And like an- another thing I have to say that I found really weird when I was learning one's complement and two's complement arithmetic uh, this semester was that it's very similar to the way that we learned doing like old style arithmetic or the way that we should have learned doing old style arithmetic. However, my elementary school was all like, that's, you know, old style arithmetic's for chumps. Don't do it that way. Or we'll like point and laugh at you. And I was like, guys, that's not nice. You hate pointers. Yeah. Right. (laughs) And basically the, the trick is then like, I had to learn this year, basically I had to learn, um, that that notation again yep. and i had you know the, the thing where you do the 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 one number over the other and then put the sign on the left and draw a line underneath it yeah because like i went to i went to what i thought was a pretty normal school but they always like frowned upon that so never fully learned it so take that that's how computers work first grade <laughs> teacher you know yeah <laughs> i remember in second grade you know, you 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 start learning like multi-digit, uh, you know, sums and subtractions. Yeah. And I remember telling yeah. my mom, "I'm never going to need to subtract numbers that have three digits in them. That's silly." <laughs> <laughs> womp, womp, womp. And then, and then weeks after I told them that, I stumbled my way into the gifted and talented math program by figuring <laughs> out how to multiply big numbers quickly. Nice. Oops. There you go. Yep. You don't need well, I think that, you don't need three digit mm-hmm. addition. You have three digit multiplication. It's faster. Truth. 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 All right. So, so do you want to keep going about more fringe things that I had put in or do you want to save it for later? I don't have access to my Mac right now. That sounds really lazy because it is it's actually like in the back of my car. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's pretty um, far. It's you're you're keeping it in cold it's below freezing. Is that really a safe thing to do? Well, my my car's in my garage, and the garage is heated dish, I think. Okay, so it's the, the garage is at least above freezing, I think. It's 40. I'll, I'll go get, you know, it's 30 instead of, yeah, I mean, 33 instead of 32. Exactly, right? I'll, I'll get it out of there pretty soon. It's but fine. I'm, I'm lazy, and it's in my car. I mean, and I don't go you know, so I the soon first one. is like eight oh. hours when he drives back to work. Yeah, right? Yeah, just saying. <laughs> for Well, for that homebrew packages of what we have installed i was just thinking what cool things like not necessarily helper libraries or whatnot but just anything notable i was just going through it today i was i installed bash for Mm -hmm. through homebrew on my desktop because i did it on my macbook a while ago Mm -hmm. and i put on vim and i you know i have i think i have lame and ffmpeg and git and heroku tool about python two and three yeah tree uh w get uh right right so some things like that i don't know if there's anything that you guys really like and use i just want to know why you installed w again because i used it to download something once i don't know well, why didn't you just use curl because then it i don't know okay I just, I just make sure it, it has the fancy progress bar curl has progress <laughs> bars I've used wget more than curl, so I don't know. I do they are they the exact same? Or no, they... the syntax is completely different. I hate curl, but I uh, don't install software on the Mac. I use what the Mac gives me. Okay, that's that's fair. I see. I learned kind of like Brian did that curl was the one to use for reasons that I don't fully understand. But well, I wget also... is so... real. Curl is a real thing people actually develop. No, totally, totally. Right? So I, I use curl all the time when I'm making HTTP requests. Oh, yeah. I think it's yeah. really awesome for making HTTP requests. Crawler. Yeah. For, for downloading files, I almost never use curl because uh, unless it's like a, a text file, right? Exactly. If it's if I know it's plain text, I use curl. Otherwise, I use wget. That's a weird thing. I don't, I don't know. We're going to have to dive into that in depth. So so here's, here's, here's one quick question for you, Ryan. 
and this 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 will blow my mind if it's if if the answer is what I think it is, which is probably not terribly uh, world shattering to most people, but it's going to be world shattering to me. So is the <laughs> syntax for downloading like a blob or a binary file with curl simply the the same syntax that you'd use if you're making a get request and then you pipe it to a file? Uh, I always just name my file with dash o. That too. <sighs> I see. I despise dash o. I, I know. I, I know. I hate it too. I hate curl, but that doesn't so mean do I don't use you it. You do curl, and you have to pipe it through, or do you have to pass an argument to give it an output file name, or what? How yeah, do you so, download a binary so, file with curl? Then? Um. Well, as far as I know, you just wait. I'll just man it. Hold, hold on. Don't fade out. So, as far as I know, you you do curl, download URL, and then space, and then dash big o, and then dash name. I believe. Okay. Oh. Well, That's look not at too that. Bad. Or you can do dash capital O and it'll just download the file as you've requested it. Even better. Hmm. Huh. Look at I that. Do, what's a test file that I can do? You can uh, do my, um, if you, if you, you can do, do my, my password. Yeah, so, <laughs> if you do my time, it's uh, not binary, but close. You can do war game download. Yeah. Uh, let me look in Slack for your, that zip file you sent a while ago. That's uh, so funny. Yeah. Here's war game go dash zero zero two wait let me cd the downloads sounds like more fun nice dash big o so the reason i the reason i'm uh a, a, a distinguisher instead of a oh, loyal w getter is because when i was in the high school and i was being the nefarious i decided to make a reverse SSH Sox proxy, nice. Or I not it's not really Sox proxy. It's a reverse tunnel in which I could run the Sox proxy through. So basically, in my ultimate nefariousness, I took the library's Mac, and I decided to run a reverse tunnel so that I could SSH into it without having uh, a static IP address for it. Nice. So that way, I could Sox proxy through it and use the school's IP address to browse. Nice. (laughs) (laughs) Miracle that worked. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of work (laughs) and awesome. And and so the reason I needed to use curl is to download my script and to to ping my server back. I would use curl to do that. Right, right. Because it doesn't have wget on a Mac. Yeah. So there you go. Nice. Yeah. My gosh. I, I always used to try to to set up a reverse Sox proxy. It, like in high school, I was I was trying to do the same thing. And it worked really well the first time and then never again. So either they caught on to me or more likely I just broke it in a really stupid way and never fixed it. <laughs> yeah, it's it, in my experience, I don't think any like I don't think any high school individually or even district is actually smart enough to even know what a tunnel is, what Sox is, what SSH is. Uh, to be honest, I'm pretty impressed if they had any of any clue what those terms even meant. It's more likely some, that it's just finicky in general. I bet some know about it, but they're just like, "Oh, they're smart kids. Let them go. Let them do it. They, they deserve a reward of <laughs> doing what they want." I met. You know, we, that's we that's how a, I believe. That's what I believe, but I don't think a lot of them think that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And then you get if they realize what you're doing, they'll just threaten to expel you or something. No, no, yeah. no. SPPS hasn't expelled anyone in like ten years. Wah, wah. Yeah, but if it's like uh, internet related, computer related, of I don't know. No, knows. no, you don't even get expelled for that. But it can be Saturday school. No CFAA. Uh, no CFAA uh, abuses or CFAA uh, violations at SPPS. Uh, no, probably good. not. That's good. Well, so in in my, I think that was senior year. I don't remember when that all went down, but basically somebody was being clever and they took their Wireshark laptop and they brought it in and they were listening for any teacher using a website, not HTTPS, you know, not secured. So they could see the raw platform, the, the raw password going through the packets. And of course it just happened to be during when I was doing inventory for the library. And of course, I knew what the library password for the administrator accounts were because I was doing inventory. And of course, the Inquisition comes around and says, well, you know the password, so it must have been you. And I'm like, no, look at that. It wasn't me. Did I log in anywhere? What computer did I do it on? 
Oh, none of them. Hmm, right. Yep. And and so eventually they found the guy because they basically um did it again to somebody else. <laughs> Clever work. Oh, but not expelled. Hey. Yeah. No 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 new Matthew Keys coming from SPPS, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm you know, uh we told SPPS when we were there uh, of various yeah. vulnerabilities, such as their printers being hopelessly vulnerable. So, for example, you could walk up to the building just to just to get on the public Wi-Fi because the Wi-Fi is public. No, no scrutinization yeah, yeah. there. No X five hundred. So you know, just just log, just, just click yes, and, and then you could send out packets that printers would ex, you know expect. <laughs> so you know, you you search oh, no. for printers. So then. What you do is you find out what the printer's IP addresses are. You know, you either use and Active you Directory. Talk to it. Yeah, so you just talk yeah. to it. So you either use Active Directory or uh, Bonjour or whatever you like. Doesn't matter. You, not only can you talk to it and print it out, you know, print things out. You can edit the administrative settings on the printers because none of them are secure. <laughs> so oh, no. what you can do is, you know, pretty much anything. But one of my favorite things to do, or you know, hypothetically, as we said, is to set the copy count to nine hundred and ninety nine. <laughs> So that any print job would print forever. <laughs> now, oh, no. we told them about this. To? We told to... this. Oh, who did we go to? Yeah. Well, after the Inquisition, after the guy, uh, you know, uh, you know, found the, his way into the library systems and stuff, they thought about security a bit harder. And so they asked us, well, do you guys know anything else about the school that we should work about and blah, blah, blah. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, we we decided to reveal some of our treasure trove of secrets, and one of those was this printer thing. And mm. w- you know, it was just just the school's tech at the time, whose name I don't remember anymore. But presumably, he had no clue what we were talking about because he just did not understand an IP address. What's that? And uh, so so uh, that was in 2011. I've been back since, you know, for various community education classes, and you know, just just driving by. And those printers are still unsecured. Oh, no. So, you know, I agree that it's unlikely that somebody possesses such skill in high school. However, as the time marches forth, it is easier and more likely to not only acquire the tools of the trade, but also the skills of the trade. Mm -hmm. True. Now, I have to say, I find that just mind boggling because at the U, we're like. Oh, yeah. Printer, printer security is a huge thing. Because like it costs we, money. Yeah, that's yeah, but, true. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Why does, like, uh, not higher, under edu- lower education not care about computer tech very much? Because I feel like that's always, you know, higher ed's okay, the lower ed's always meh. Well, one's treated as a business slash enterprise, and one is treated as a home network. I mean, look at that school. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. Okay, maybe not like, even a home network, but like small business. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and and the, the one of the things that's so interesting about the higher ed space is that like a lot of higher ed institutions, the U included, basically like invented a lot of the things that that we know of as the internet, right? Like, right. I mean, the at at the U we had Gopher, um, and uh-huh. Gopher Gopher is so much fun. I got to talk to one of the guys who um who uh was what is Gopher. Um, it's an alternative uh, protocol. It it was the original internet before, or it was the original World Wide Web before the World Wide Web was the World Wide Web. Hmm. <laughs> Hip, hipster internet. I only it's, used it's, it once, long, long ago. I I want to get a Gopher server running again just for kicks and giggles because there are some like hey, on npm. You know, it would be pretty cool if you write your Gopher server in Go. Hey. I think it's been done before. Yeah, I, I know it has. has yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, you've seen it. Okay, but you know, there's there's stuff like that, and there's stuff like Incommon, and there's stuff like Educause. These uh, organizations that were made by a bunch of universities coming together and saying, "Hey, look, we did a lot of stuff for the digital computers," and as such, they kind of take things a little bit more seriously. I think, like a lot of um, like networking forensic stuff. Um, Absolutely, stuff I, I, from- I definitely agree. And that's that's something that just like nobody at high schools have really. Well, and I think there's, I mean, you know, so the U has the people, it has people resources to actually go and do those things. High schools alone barely have enough teachers, let enough alternative staff to go and 
police the internet. I remember when Central was, you know, forcing you to uh, sign like pieces of paper to respectable, respectably use the internet or something. You know, get permission. Yeah, or something. yeah. I don't and it, remember that. Well, call. yeah. So by the time you got in, I think it was only my first year. So it was okay. The year after. So that would be your first year. They stopped doing it. I remember the first yeah. year in the library to use one of the computers, you would have to turn in your calculator or planner to use the computer and have your permission form signed. And they would check to see you had it signed. They stopped doing that because it was dumb. <laughs> no, I think that's I good. Doing that junior high. I think I remember something. I you know, know. Was, I don't know. I sounds vaguely familiar. Who knows? Yeah, it's pretty bad. Policies. What are those? Like, it's just, you know, it's it's like terms of service. Like, having somebody sign it isn't going to change whether or not they're going to read it and abide by it. TBH. If anything, money. making them sign a paper thing is going to show them how little they actually police it and know well, what they're doing. So, a- as a person who worked frequently in the library, because I had nothing to do in high school or uh, any time in my life, I would uh, help the uh, librarian, you know, sort through all of these things. And totally, uh, turns out after you signed the paper, they were put into a stack in the other room and ignored for long periods of time. Hmm. Just did they? Oh, totally. They, I, I don't think they even had like a, a spreadsheet of who had <laughs> done it and who hadn't done it. Uh, and even to this day, those sheets are still probably in that back room. <laughs> oh my gosh! Is that the one between the two staircases? Uh, there? so By the elevator, or is that the or one of the side ones? No, no, know. no. It was the room between the t- between the staircases. Okay. So it, they, they redid the, the yeah. library at one point too. So I, yeah. I don't so know. if you recall how that room had looked, so if you were facing towards the clock against those staircase walls. Yeah. You would have seen the staircase on the right, or I mean on the left, and then you would have seen a room, and then the little bathroom thing, then the elevator, then another room, and then the other staircase, right? Mm-hmm. So now, um, the staircase on the left is still there, that room is still there, that's where those papers were kept, the bathroom's still there, the clock is still there, the elevator is new, the next room is gone, it's now a hallway... And then the door that led to the to the right staircase is now gone because that's where the new other elevator is now. Also, <laughs> okay. Um, so now we have two elevators at that school. Although my reporting insiders have told me that neither of them work quite occasionally. Ha ha ha. You have insiders. Yeah, hmm. I do. I have a neighbor across the street who's a freshman there. I should talk with him. You know. <laughs> Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you one more thing, and then we can move on, I guess, if you want. Uh, for for high school specifically, uh, it, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you know this, Brandon, but our high school is pretty special. It has a great legacy of producing amazing tech people, such as the guy, or one of them at least, who invented the YouTube. Nice. One of the co-founders. One of the three, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yaweed, or Karim, or something like that. Is he the guy who did the zoo video? Yeah, the I believe I video? believe he is the zoo guy. Yes, I thought so. Um, and so I really shouldn't, uh, con- you know, attribute Central's influence on him to any of his success because he's German, I think. So there, <laughs> there you go. Um, but if we did tri- attribute some success for YouTube to Central, I always wondered why doesn't any of the successful people from Central or any high school really just come back and pour boatloads of their success money into these schools, basically to make slave factories out of them in a happy kind of way. And I know the answer now. <laughs> oh, no. I yeah, know, I continue, Ryan. <laughs> I know the answer now. Not only do you hate the place, like I love Central, but I hate the place. I'm not going to give them any money. Every time something you know, is given to them, they screw it up. What's a computer? I don't know. What's a dollar bill? I don't know. <laughs> And you can't win just by giving people things unless you take authoritative control, which you can't do in a high school or, or uh, you know, a public school like that. Uh, it doesn't doesn't work. So yeah. you can't just give blanket sums of huge money and expect something to actually happen. You know, if I give Central a million dollars after becoming a millionaire, what are they going to do with it? 
buy computers? No, they're gonna spend it on iPads. Great, crap, so much for that. It's about the pe the people that make the biggest difference. So I, I guess my conclusion is that I know why now no successful people help their high school because it won't matter in the long run. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. It's kind of a sobering and sad thing to think about, but you're right. And so sense. now I'm sure, like, in, in after the 16th, like, literally, on the 17th, I don't know what day that is, but on the 17th, I know for sure, in my inbox, the University of Minnesota is going to be sending, Hello, alumni! How are you doing? <laughs> and I, I'm not going to respond. Well, maybe maybe one year. Uh, <laughs> Google Docs almost crashed my browser, I think. <laughs> Safari is using nearly 10 gigabytes of RAM right now. Just That's with insane. Oh, no. with SoundCloud, Google Docs, and Hangouts. Google Docs and Safari is incredibly memory sucking. To ch not to change the topic or anything. Oh, no, no. Please change. <laughs> <laughs> So is this is, is this what we just what we just had here? This fringe is this like uh, ATP's? You know, after the music cut. I don't know how long they talk before or after. And it's it, this was almost a show on its own. Yeah, we could just re we could just release this as Podcast 16. Sure, sounds good. We had some <laughs> titles. Okay, well before we get there, have a good one.